So I'm going to try to cover uh, probably too much. I, that's my usual mistake. I try to cover too much. Um, but, uh, but I want, you know, there's an important reason to try to give this kind of some, the scope and some depth. And, you know, and I said this uh, talk is going to be about agencies of art and the audience. And, um, and so I want to, you know, kind of go through this, this uh, a, a bit of a history of what I do and why I do it and the, some of the kind of framing questions that it's leading to. Um, and as uh, Don said, I'm, a, I'm an artist. I work across lots of different forms and mediums. Um, but underlying that, there's always, uh, it's always been computation as an a, as a agency of, of creation and as an agency that establishes this relationship between art and the audience. Um, and now, one of the recent things that I've done um, is started this Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, which is partially located here in Cal IT2 and partially over at the SME building. And um, so I want to just talk a little bit about this uh, idea about imagination as one of these kinds of, of agents between art and audience. And um, uh, so, so the mission of the Clark Center is to understand, enhance, and enact human imagination. It's no small task, very kind of grandiose vision, because first of all, we may want to ask a question about what is imagination itself. And uh, so imagination is a, you know, it's, a, it's like a popular word. It's not necessarily a, a scientific word. It might mean a million different things. In fact, it, you know, probably means maybe not a million different things, but, you know, at least a dozen different things, um, depending on what scales you might ask about what the phenomena of imagination is, um, both in terms of, of scale of activity from neurons to brains to societies to the time frames of imagination. Does imagination shape what you're expecting to hear me say in the very next word as you anticipated and imagined? Uh, so imagination is a, a kind of, might be a basis of human connection and empathy. Um, or imagination might be a way in which we think about, uh, you know, what, you know what, might, what might be the effects of pouring tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. What kind of world might that create in 100 years? Um, so imagination can operate in the instant and in the, and in the millennial time scales. Um, uh, and, um, and, some, and a lot of kind of interesting smart people, you know, kind of tout, say, say kind of interesting, inspiring things about imagination. Uh, Einstein, you know, says imagination is more important than knowledge and that it's everything, it's a preview of life's coming attractions, and that logic gets you from A to Z, but imagination gets you everywhere. And you know, so that's nice. You know, Einstein you know, thinks a lot about imagination, but he doesn't actually help us figure out what it is. Um, so we still don't know anything more about imagination from these, except that it's, you know, it's, it's an inspiring idea. Um, the uh, educator, Maria Montessori, talks about imagination, that it doesn't become great until uh, human beings, given the courage and strength, use it to create. So it's a, maybe now a little more kind of a differentiation between imagination and creativity. Um, uh, the scientist Carl Sagan uh, gives us another inspiring motto of imagination will carry us to worlds that never were, but without it we go nowhere. Um, and, um, and, I, and I like this quote from Mark Twain, and I'll and you'll understand more in a moment, that you can't, you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. So there's so now some kind of, I think, a, a bit of a cognitive phenomena being described here that Oliver Sacks uh, takes a little bit further to get, actually now start to describe something a little deeper about what imagination might be, that every act of perception is to some degree an act of creation, and every act of memory is to some degree an act of imagination. And, uh, and that, I think, is a key idea that I want you to keep in mind for, uh, for a little bit here. Um, because then I'm going to turn this around and talk about the relationship of art. So the uh, 19th century art uh, theorist, George Raymond, talks about art as distinctly a pro distinctively a product of the imagination. So art has, you know, really no other kind of 
necessary function in the world. It is kind of free from a certain level of, of, of instrumentality to be able to con, kind of act completely within this realm of the imagined. And, and so if we think about, back to Sachs, about this idea about what art and imagination are, um, you know, uh, imagination is always employed in the completion of a work of art. Um, when we look at something like this, which is a, 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 a fresco on the, on the ceiling of a church whose name just slipped my mind. If I was in presenter mode, I would see the name here. Um, but it's in Rome, and it uses all sorts of, of ways to engage our imagination to bring us into the phenomena of the artwork. For one thing, it's painted on a flat ceiling. It uses trompe l'oeil to kind of blend the real architectural elements with the fake ar architectural elements. It's obviously trying to engage us in a narrative about transcendence and about in, into another realm. So it engages us in, a, in our narrative imagination. And it's situated with all of these perspectival tricks that we think we are a part of the, uh, we are part of the story that it's trying to tell. Um, but all it is is just little blobs of colored paint that in fact don't have any relationship to uh, anything that it's actually trying to represent. Our brain completes all of those stories for us in our imagination. So even as through time, we've tried to take and, and instrumentalize our acts of perception and representation. So this, uh, draw, this etching by Albrecht Dürer of one of his devices he uses to try to uh, quantify the, uh, the view that, that he's working with to try to get a more and more accurate representation. So now maybe the artist imagination is taken a little bit out of the loop in a way that uh, you know, it's not complete, he's not completely making it up, but he's trying to have a, verac a, a, a relationship with, the, with reality that has veracity, instrumental veracity. Now, of course, he also gives us then, he uses that same methodology to give us this very famous uh, etching of drawing of a rhinoceros, um, which is uh, uh, easily, you know, a great part of it is fantasy. And, but it was the predominant way in which Europeans thought a the, what a rhinoceros was for several hundred years. Um, and in part because it is used this, uses this kind of representational veracity as a way to kind of give authenticity to what is a, you know, a, a, in, in large part of fantasy. And, um, and so over time, you know, there's this relationship between kind of uh, visual representations that have veracity um, and we're driven to the, those things throughout the Renaissance with the invention of lenses and camera obscuras, which are shown that they can show you very clearly what's actually in the world, such as your unicorns. They're excellent tools for capturing this. You know, so again, we kind of are continually slipping between reality and fantasy. And, and later in, this, in the 19th century, we're starting to get into these understandings of these proto we're creating all these proto-cinematic devices that are explicitly uh, uh, toying with our perception. Um, so here we have the very famous uh, sequence of images by Edward Muybridge, which is trying to, you know, in, a, in a working for Stanford, trying to see if does a horse's four legs ever actually leave the ground and produces this series of images, which you can put into a zoetrope. And now it appears we're watching a horse run. Um, so now we're exploiting the, uh, the limits of our perception to take what is just a set of static images and now produce this illusion of cinematic motion, and which then is further, <clears throat> further developed and exploited by people like Edison, who invents the first YouTube videos in uh, about the same time frame. So I would say that art itself is always this collaboration between our senses and our imagination. And, and so it's easy to say that about art, but of course we can also just expand that a little bit and it's just our perception of a reality. Re you know, we see the world um, through this through this collaborative relationship 
<clears throat> and that imagination happens at very small levels and at very large levels. And um, so here's a cartoon. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'll maybe read it out loud. Hello, 911. I'm trapped. It's dark, and I can't see anything except those two, these two distorted splotches of light. Help. Splotches of light? Your eyeballs? Yeah, I think that's what they are. There's, there's meat everywhere. Ah, so you're a brain. Yes. Yeah, we all are. You're, you're, you're not trapped. Use your body to walk around and experience reality. But everything's just signals in my sensory cortices. How can I be sure they correspond to an external world? I'm sorry, but we can't send a search and rescue team into Plato's cave. And um, so, of course, you know, this is all, this is long the, 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 you know, the, the crux of Western philosophy about, you know, what, what is it about the world that we know and don't know, and how do we know this? And so Plato, you know, thinks that we basically experience the world as if we're these prisoners locked in a cave, and, um, and we're watching the world as if it's uh, sh just shadows cast on a wall. Um, and that the only people who actually really see this particular situation are philosophers. Um, the rest of us are, you know, poor saps, uh, not really knowing what the extent of reality is. So in the Clark Center, we have these ambitions to, you know, try to, ask, to understand this phenomenon of imagination, to research specific questions of it. Is there, is there a neuroscience of it? What is this kind of social role of imagination? And then if we understand it, can we start to create positive feedbacks, um, feedback loops in imagination um, that can help accelerate its development? <clears throat> now, all of this came out of uh, work that, um, that I've been doing so for, since the time I met Don 20 years ago at David Brin's house um, to uh, new forms of culture that come out of the development of computing. And it got me thinking that what we were really doing in these new vanguard forms of art were creating a kind of speculative culture. We were prototyping aspects of our technological, cultural, social condition that uh, to, to put particular emphasis on, on certain aspects of them. And so would, you know, so how could we now take that on very directly um, to help to develop imagination and in individuals and in societies to better anticipate the world to come, to look at how our own uh, statements about the future um, are, are produced or reified by our acts in the present. And that one thing that I look specifically at um, is that we look specifically at is science fiction and whether or not that over a hundred year history of, of cultural activity, which is specifically about looking, you know, casting our gaze forward. What does that actually do to influence, to help us think through at a social cultural level, the actual uh, outcomes of our present day actions? And, and now as we develop these new methods of understanding imagination and cognitive and neurosciences, how might these be incorporated into new kinds of cultural experiences? Um, and so, um, so between those two things, that gives us this basis of the Clark Center. Then it allow, causes, calls us to pull into, into play people from a lot of different disciplines. So we have people from all of these areas that are uh, participating in Clark Center activities. And we have an advisory board drawn from uh, people across campus from cognitive science, physics, literature, et cetera. And, um, and we also work with uh, uh, a number of science fiction authors. And these are maybe the you know, five of them that are very closely involved in the center. And the reason is, part of the reason is, is that they're all graduates of UCSD. And so this becomes another uh, key aspect of this is that UCSD has produced more of today's notable science fiction authors than any other university in the world. And, um, and it did that uh, completely by accident. And, um, and so now, uh, I guess my, 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 my hope is that now that we take this on more deliberately, that we don't screw the, that whole thing up, you know? Um, but they came out of different parts of the university, from computer science, from physics, from literature. Um, and, uh, and so between these, these sets of people, we have this broad interdisciplinary conversation to, that helps us shape our activities around uh, human imagination, and just later tonight, we have a, 
a film uh, sleep dealer that will be playing down the hall um, and, a, and a panel tomorrow about Latino and Latina science fiction. But let me now turn back to some of this work that got me to the point of asking those kinds of questions. And so as I said, I have this, I'm, I'm an artist. That's what I'm hired to do. That's still what I do. Um, that's still in ultimately the, the outcome that I look for from my work. And so this is a, just an overview of a bunch of things over time. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk narrowly about one kind of activity that I do. And I'll try to leave some time to give a demo of a project that's now in development. Um, but I do these uh, multimedia environments which try to put into play questions about the nature between our experiences of media mediated reality and physical reality. So I'll show you a couple of older pieces, just one minute video clips. The Casa is two casas and my house is your house is a binational networked virtual reality playhouse. About half of it's here in San Diego at the Children's Museum. The other half is in Mexico City at the National Center for the Arts. It has two physical spaces in each of these locales. And within these physical spaces, there are a number of things that kids can play with and interact with. Some oversized tools, a giant ball they spin around, a kind of magic mirror. Um, and while they're doing that, they're inputting events into a computer that creates a 3D computer graphic uh, representation of what they're doing. And that 3D computer graphic representation is shared by both physical spaces. Smoke and Mirrors is an artwork commissioned by the Fleet Science Center of San Diego, which allows two to six visitors at a time to enter into a shared virtual environment. Participants navigate through a series of maze-like environments that explore the shifting ways in which the tobacco industry constructs cultural images and the social environment to maximize usage of its product. Participants attempt to escape the messages that have made tobacco usage desirable and acceptable, even as a growing body of knowledge has increasingly shown the deleterious effects that its consumption has upon the body. Each visitor first has their face three-dimensionally scanned and affixed to an avatar constructed from an isolated biological system. A network of computers connects each user into the shared environment, and a simple interface allows for control of one's movement through the mazes. So these projects, uh, so this one is done in the like opened in like 1997 when you know the, we were this was still fairly novel we had lots of popular cultural speculation about this nature of virtual reality but it but at the time it was almost even impossible to get an internet connection in Mexico City we had to steal it by re-aiming a microwave dish from the university just a little bit so it could capture where this was being shown and then this is done in the early 2000s as as now computer games became the kind of realm in which this kind of experience was taking place. <clears throat> now to kind of uh, fast forward a, uh, a number of years from there, I'm going to talk a little more specifically about this Scalable City project, which is a, really an engine that I've created that generates lots of uh, out art, different kinds of artworks out of it. So there's sets of prints that come out of it, there's videos and movies, machinima, and, uh, but primarily, this, it, the, what drives it is this uh, interactive museum-based uh, environment. But from it, it's trying to look at this relationship between uh, data, algorithms, and users. And so I have a, you know, another way in which I could say that, that that formula is the formula of contemporary culture. We have sets of data, we have algorithms we develop, and we have user interactions. And then from that, cultural experience is generated. And so here, I try to make that a very overt condition by taking data scans from the real world, putting them into algorithmic systems that, are, um, that take a familiar object and now start to defamiliarize it, put it in a kind of suggested alternative use. And, and the users interact with this to articulate it. So for instance, a lot of this came from satellite imagery and looking for patterns and anal analyzing those patterns and then creating new representations that highlight the particular patterns there. Um, so I make a, a joke that this is that Carmel Valley development that just got <laughs> voted down. But, um, um, 
But so some of these are, you know, these very, uh, you know, kind of classical things that I think both give us a kind of beauty of pattern, that patterning that com computation can readily give us, but also kind of produce an outcome that we might be wary of. Um, so it's set up in these large multimedia uh, environments that are, um, can be many different screens or they can be in 3D or different kinds of setups. And it gets shown uh, uh, at museums all around the world. Um, just finished a tour of Russia and Switzerland with uh, three or four museums. Um, and I'll show, well, let me see. I want to check my time. Um, okay, maybe I'll show this. This is a four minute video. Um, so this video, I'll just set it up. What I, what I do is when, I, when people play this in the, in, in the museum, I capture all of their play sessions um, as data. And then I can go back and re and do stuff with that, with that data. For instance, I can re-render it. So this is a three-minute movie uh, re-rendered out of those play sessions that is mastered in 3D 4K. Um, but we won't see it in 3D 4K here.
So, um, so in the process of creating uh, most of my work up to this point, I'd always been able to count on designing a project. It would take me a couple years to build it. And that by the time I was done, whatever com the computer platforms that I could count on would be twice as fast. And, uh, and as I'm you know, approaching that with this project, realizing, well, you know, we still, Moore's Law is still technically in effect, but the way in which you have to program the way computers are taking advantage of Moore's Law now has to really change. So in the first part of the, in the kind of mid-20 20, 20 knots, um, uh, I ran into this problem and ended up finding myself having to dig into how to do uh, parallel programming and multi-core uh, software development. And, um, and ended up working with, uh, primarily with um, uh, Intel and IBM um, on supporting this work. And we, then with a few other academic partners, we created a National Science Foundation consortium lab on multi-core computing. Um, and so that, uh, so I you know, ended up becoming a kind of quasi-expert in parallel programming in order to get this artwork to work the way I needed it to work. Um, and, uh, and it's been a very valuable continuation because it's also then driven us, driven me and the, uh, guy, the people I work with in my lab to develop a number of kind of innovative approaches to doing that. So for instance, in the Scalable City project, we ended up creating a parallelized physics engine that does orders of magnitude more uh, uh, complex computation than other existing physics simulators. Um, because we uh, did very optimized parallel computing methods. We also have developed methods in which we use uh, large-scale hybrid server systems to be able to serve <clears throat> both that artwork and the other works that you're going to see in a bit. Um, and so here's a little bit of a, another short video that describes that. accelerated procedural computing techniques to create a virtual world that is rich with visual complexity and dynamic behaviors. We are in the midst of transforming this into a massive multi-user experience, enabled through the development of a new systems design. Hosted at the San Diego Supercomputer Center is an IBM Z10 mainframe, along with an extensible number of hybrid computational accelerator boards. This system computes the asset transformation and dynamics of the virtual world while maintaining the coherency of tens of thousands of entities for many simultaneous users. This gives us an approach for creating a new type of virtual world experience, one which combines the visual and behavioral complexities of next generation computer games with the social interactions that virtual worlds have been designed around. Current approaches require you to make trade-offs between these two types of virtual experiences. A key approach is the use of the OpenCL programming framework which allows our software to be flexibly deployed across a range of computing devices, including the mainframe server, server-based accelerators, and client systems which mix multi-core CPUs with powerful GPUs. This new approach for how virtual worlds are computed will help them to be more engaging cultural experiences and make them more applicable to a wide array of social undertakings in which complex activities are best understood through the interactions of many people. So obviously a, a technical description video that uh, is done for the supercomputing conference of a few years back. So now in, in, with this work then, this ability to capture all this data of everybody interacting in it and then restaging it, um, we developed an application called the Virtual World Director which allows us to kind of then replay and then develop new kinds of scripts within this corpus of people interacting in these data environments. And, and in the process of doing that, uh, came up with this problem that we have all this data of all these play sessions. Which ones are actually interesting? I'm not going to go back and watch like a thousand people playing this game. I'm just, it's, it's, it's too much. Um, and, and so, you know, I noted that if I'm watching, but if I am watching people play it in a gallery, you know, I can note when 
there's a good session. And I can note also when someone's playing the environment and they might need a nudge of some sort to get them to go from like, you know, being totally baffled uh, to having an experience where they go, whoa, or aha. And, and so, you know, I, I realized in the process of trying to solve one problem, I was actually stumbling into maybe a much more interesting problem. Um, how do people have, and what about this environment gives them those moments of insight? And could I actually find those in the data? And if not, could I find ways in which I could move them, give them small nudges in the direction of their particular interest that might give them those moments of insight? And so, uh, so I started coming up with ways of visualizing the experience of people in this environment. And um, so here, for instance, this is a kind of a typical visualization. It's a heat map of showing how far, how long people are, uh, are in a particular area. Um, and we can visualize a lot of different dimensions of the data there. <clears throat> but what I really needed to do was come up with a different description of the environment that made sense from the data set. So I had to, so I came up with a set of semantics about the environment, which were different from what I had designed in the environment. So the environment, as you can see, it's, 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 there's no like real purpose to it. It's not like you, like a video game where I could easily keep a score, um, uh, or even know that it's better for a person to, you know, kind of stand in one place and maybe look around a little, or is it better for a person to try to race around and see if they can get around the world as fast as possible? Either type of experience is perfectly fine, um, as as long as the the user is actually being engaged with the, with the experience and getting some kind of insight. So one thing I can do is I can capture all sorts of parameters of different people and overlay them together. So make scatter plots of you know, how long people have spent in a different area, how much people are turning versus going forward, um, other kinds of things. And then what I could see is that there are certain kinds of tendencies that there are people who like to be deliberate lookers, and there's people who like to travel quickly. And I could start to see that in the pattern of their activity and maybe try to make the environment respond to fulfill what I'm guessing their desires are, or maybe at times kind of present them an alternative to what they're going after to give them deeper insight. And so here's a visu another visualization of some of those relationships. So the blue dot, this is an overhead view of a, the blue dot is a person moving through. The pink dot is, a, uh, is the ca virtual camera that their movements control. And based on how fast they move and where they are, that camera has, it's like an algorithmic string. And so now I'm just going to show a bunch of different users, all normalized at the origin. And, there are, and what you're seeing in the trace is all of their virtual cameras uh, paths being traced out. And with these different users, what I would find is that there's certain kinds of, of morphologies of camera space that different kinds of users tend to articulate. Um, so I, that becomes another kind of way to characterize the experience that the different users are having. Um, and, you know, and so one of the things that I was dr I'm driven by this is there, so I, I would say that the primary parameters of experience are aesthetic. So are there kind of aesthetic criteria that I can assess from the environment? So here's an assessment of a, of a kind of a rough color space analysis. So a user who moves through the environment and uh, sees more ground or a user who sees more sky. Now, when you ask, a, when you can see people kind of creating that visual phenomena as they're going through the environment, but you can't actually ask them to articulate that they're doing that. Now in the data, we can start to see it. We can also start to see it on the kind of complexity of the environment. So here's just taking the environment and doing a uh, edge, um, reducing it to edges. And by reducing it to edges, I have a kind of a simple kind of histogram of the experience in black and white, more edges, more complexity, and we'll see another variation here of another scene that has a lot more complexity. So now here it's a little unfair just looking at a scene by scene, 
because these people will see lots of different scenes as they play it, but you average those over time. Or you look at similar places with the people who are experiencing from different, uh, at, that are at different times and seeing which visual phenomena they tend to be producing. So that starts to give me a way to kind of like interrogate what these virtual experiences are and provide some mechanism of feeding back into them and, and developing them in different ways. And, um, and so now there's been some other projects this has been applied to. So here's a project that, uh, that I've worked with the, uh, with the Rady School of Management um, called Verbella. And um, we created this virtual world uh, in which people from around the world would gather and interact in uh, complex uh, simulations. And these are business simulations that we started with. And so it started with this, uh, uh, these eight MBA schools. And we created a, a competition for them where uh, teams of, of uh, five people would, would be made, no one of which is from the same place. So the first time they're, they're, they're only interacting in this environment. There was a requirement that they all had to speak English in this, and then later on we did other experiments where we didn't have that. And um, let's see, and let me, I'll play you two short videos that describe it. At Cervella, we aim to improve online education. We develop and deliver virtual world learning platforms that allow for blended learning, including the ability to host lectures, engage in group projects, attend student fairs, play serious games, receive coaching, and compete in simulations. We have started to create and support custom online campuses for universities. The University of California, Irvine, has had students utilizing Verbella to join lectures, meet with professors during office hours, and collaborate with fellow students to work on real-world problems. Meanwhile, our development team has developed resources to foster learning and collaboration, as well as tools to research data-driven assessment of leadership and team cohesion. Thank you to the GMAT Met Fund for making it possible. Check out our demo at forbella.com. I didn't do, I didn't program the dancing at the end, <laughs> that was, um, but let me show you a clip from what this looks like in action. It's about a 30 second clip. Okay, hey, let's look at the other things. We can do sustainability. Yes, let's do it, please. Oh my God, finally. Hey, one click. click, do I push? Yeah, click. Three, click it. two, one. Trevor, hold your pizza. <laughs> We're below CO2 level. We didn't drop in the ratings. Revenue still. Fine. Let's go ahead. Go oh, mini. Mini. Go oh, mini. mini. We are the lowest. Who is controlling? Yeah, we're very low in price. We can put it up a little bit. Yeah. Who's controlling it? I am. So can? Okay. Can I take a look at expansion? Because there seems to be one reason that we couldn't expand. The market is already situated, so we cannot expand. I think no one, no one can expand right now, so it's... Yeah, exactly, so it's fine. Okay, let's keep it like this. Keep it like this. Guys, we need a decision here. Do we increase the price or not? Hiroshi? I think uh, we should increase a little bit the price. Yeah. What are you saying, Jungwon? Uh, I want to keep most. I want to keep price and market. You don't want to increase the price? I don't want to any change. So do we increase the price or not? Jung Jung doesn't want to increase the price. Guys, we have 45 seconds. Decisions, decisions. So, so what we gave, gave them in this test was uh, a, they're competing in this simulation. They're running this virtual car company over three years. There's a lot of data they have to uh, that they can consult. Um, they have to negotiate their interpersonal dynamic about how they're going to make decisions. There's multiple ways for them to make decisions in the environment. But the environment operations themselves are actually very simple. And, and we've structured it in a way so that we can tell by just where they, how they utilize space as a way to guide us into what kinds of data they're consulting, whether or not they're making serial decisions or parallel decisions. 
And so we've then kind of make, mixed two kinds of modes of analysis. One that utilizes traditional behavioral and organ, organizational psychology methods of surveys and observation. And then we look at the data we gather from, those, from the event itself and see if our analysis and assessment of the data compares to the analysis and assessment of, of, of traditional techniques. Um, and so there are some things that, you know, as we're kind of exploring ways in which we do this that became very obvious. So this is a, a printout of all these different teams' voice stress patterns. And so one thing we noted was the team that actually the, had the best actual performance in the environment and, and in the assessments showed that people were cooperative, that they had leadership, you know, capacity, et cetera, had a, a, a particular pattern of voice stress. And teams that were very poor in their performance had a very different pattern. You know, so, and, and these are things you might guess, you know, very dominant speakers, you know, people who, you know, the team isn't, the team isn't conversing, but, you know, they're kind of, you know, you know one person talking at everybody else. Um, other people not participating. And so from this, now we've developed a number of, um, of, of methodologies of data analysis for these kinds of experiences and have did, a, did projects with the SCAG School uh, Drug Discovery. <clears throat> we have a grant pending with um, local math teachers to teach a new method of, of high school math. Uh, and these math teachers, uh, we want to, we're working with teachers across the San Diego County School District. They don't have time to get together in the real world. So they only have about an hour every afternoon to get together, or three times a week to get together, to talk to each other about their methods and to prototype methods of teaching. So they want to use Verbella to do this. <clears throat> so we have ways, so a number of different projects. In, uh, in January, the initial grant for this uh, came to an end. And now it's been um, licensed out of the university uh, by a startup. And so now we have a relationship within the university where we're doing research and a startup who's uh, taking work that's been done and trying to commercialize it. And so now that's data that just looks at um, behavioral data, analysis that just looks at behavioral data. But we're also trying to look at what can we get by looking at brains themselves. And so we first, you know, plug EEG data into what we're doing in Scalable City and look for correlations there. And as we've done that, we've seen that there are certain kinds of data signatures that we're able to, to see in the brain and certain ones that we, you know, just, you know, forget about it. And, and you know, you don't, and, you, and so then you, how do you, once you figure out what you can get and is it, is it interesting, is it actionable, you know, you can see people closing their eyes really easy. You know, so uh, I can give that, hand those out in my lectures and uh, know when I should tell a joke or something. But, um, but, here, there, but there's one here that's really applicable to uh, virtual, uh, virtual environments, and it's, and it's a sense of space. And so there's two primary ways in which we create mental models when we're navigating through space. There's egocentric and allocentric. And so we're working on a, a, a new virtual world project but the first thing we do is characterize, and as we go, we continue to check whether or not people are having this egocentric versus allocentric experience of space. So one in which you move through space and you see yourself in a global coordinate system, one in which you move through space and you see your own coordinate system as the, uh, as the one of, of importance and map the world around you. So we have a small experiment that we validated that uh, that can show this, and then when we when we show that and get people to kind of say, well, you know, this is where you think you came from, um, we'll get two different answers, and they'll correlate to different brain patterns that we can uh, that we can see through EEG, and so then we can continue to look at that brain pattern with that particular person as they move through the environment, and we're doing a number of spatial. Uh, uh, move them through a number of spatial exercises to see if they continue to keep that allocentric or egocentric uh, brain state, or are there ways we can actually change people's brain states? Um, 
so we look at that at the, so there's, there, there's a couple of cognitive signatures that we think are really uh, interesting. And so I think that's the question, you know, it's like, these are actually interesting for us to kind of make new forms of culture from. Um, uh, another thing we're looking at is we're working with a um, uh, stem cell scientist and uh, to look at the neuronal basis of imagination. And um, so Alison Motri, who's in the School of Medicine here, has it, can, he, he can make Neanderthal neurons. And so Neanderthal neurons are interesting because if we look at Neanderthal culture, we see that you know, the earliest artifacts that we have from them are you know, things like these arrowheads. And then the latest artifacts that we have from them are things like these arrowheads. And so over, you know, uh, over you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years, their culture remained fairly static um, from what we can see in the artifact record. But now when we look at modern humans, when we start to see this overlap with uh, the artifactual culture of modern humans, we see you know, the same kind of arrowheads. But over a much shorter time, we move from those to uh, much more useless <coughs> high technology like uh, Google Glass. Um, which in a few years, the joke about Google Glass, I think will be, that'll be a done joke when, when, when something you know, really extraordinary comes out of that work. Um, but so what we've, you know, so here we are, we're, you know, we're, we're very close to Neanderthals in lots of ways. In fact, we only differ from them by just a handful of genes, really. And just a few of those genes are important to trigger uh, neuronal development. So, um, so we have this experiment that we're uh, getting going now about growing uh, Neanderthal neurons um, by taking human stem cells and genetic engineering those, those handful of gene differences to produce these neurons and, and compare their morphological differences, but more importantly, their functional differences. You know, so can we, so setting up an experiment in which we uh, uh, create different kinds of phenomena and neurons will try to anticipate, they'll fall into patterns of anticipation of this. And so our hypothesis, which we've yet to prove, is that we will see these kind of different functional responses in these different kinds of conditions. Um, so now I want to show you this project. And this is one that uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll demo it. And that's a bit of a risky thing, but I'll try. Um, So this is a, I would characterize this as an early beta of a project, and this is the only part that works right now, um, but it's, a, it's an artificial life environment. So um, in this environment is a simulation of evolution um, that is taking place with these little entities. So you see there's these little collections of, of cubes, red, blue, yellow, sometimes gray. And they, each of them has a genetic code that describes its, its function and its metabolism. Now, this is uh, set up so that uh, actually all of you would be able to interact with this environment through your cell phone. Um, so here, I can go in and capture, capture one of these and bring it to my cell phone. And then I can try to look at this little entity and optimize its attributes. So I'll put it in a little uh, 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 rapid evolution genetic manipulator here. 
So here I'm gonna to try to take this one and optimize it for uh, uh, changing direction quickly, and that was a terrible one, so it didn't have the underlying characteristics. Um, but I'll come in here and grab another one, maybe this one. And this one's moving nicely. Um, so I can come in here and try to make this a more robust entity through genetic manipulation. And all I'm really doing is setting a new fitness function here on my device saying, I want you to move, very, move faster or be smarter or see further or see more things. And then I can put it back in this environment and then it will see over time. So then there's a, a an, so I just made this one, it's called Spark Puctified. So it takes its naming out of a lexicon. And, um, and over time I could see whether or not this becomes, uh, uh, has robustness in this environment. Does it take over? Does it die out? Does it go away? And um, so if a bunch of people are playing this, we could see this happen uh, from everybody's input in the, into this environment over time. Now, let me, um, another thing here. So now what's also happening here is whatever, what's taking place inside has an effect on this outer environment that it's a part of. And so what this project really sets up is multiple levels of evolution where you have this symbiotic relationship at these different scales. So here we're seeing the actual, just the initial scale of this uh, soup inside of this entity. But as we go out, as we go on and develop this further, what, you'll, what will happen is this outer entity is a part of another environment at a higher evolutionary scale. And, uh, and we'll see if that works here. Oh, and I think that's in the other version, oh, we'll see. So let's see if this next environment loads. Yeah, okay. So it moves from this lower level description that is more um, uh, the chemistry and, and low level biology to then when we start to get to higher levels of representation that are more organism based. And again here, it's a similar thing where we're able to go in and capture these entities and do again similar kinds of uh, genetic manipulations of them that then come back in and we see about their level of robustness. So it moves from different, from these, so these different kind of scales of ideas about how evolution is a schema of development um, from low level kind of model of it to biological systems to then things that start to beg the questions about cultural impacts of evolution. And, and this is by far the, the, the least uh, uh, articulated at this point. This is more just a sketch of some of the uh, aspects that are gonna be a part of it with different kinds of avatar representations and other things. So here I'm trying to give a certain kind of agency into the underlying mechanics of the system itself and utilize this scheme of evolution to make, create this kind of visceral connection to this idea about what evolution is as a process. It's kind of power, it's unexpectedness, and that it has this relationship not only to how we understand the biological world, but how we start to understand the cultural world that we're a part of. So let me just uh, so let me just finish with a couple of things. So with the so one of the things we do at the Clark Center is we try to bring these conversations to light in a number of different ways by doing these kind of research and creative projects, by doing different kinds of educational things. So we've run uh, 
seminars with the Kavli Institute here on uh, creativity and imagination. We're part of uh, helping to develop and design a new major in speculative design. Um, we run the, a summer workshop in science fiction, the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop. <clears throat> people like, uh, year, years ago, people like Bruce Sterling came out of this and uh, Kim Stanley Robinson and others. We have an annual symposium we do with the Smithsonian that we just, com we just completed uh, a version of this a few weeks ago. This is from the first version. You can recognize one of the people that you might sometimes find hanging out here. Albert Lin was a part of it uh, last year. Um, uh, and, uh, and we do, uh, we take on certain kinds of subjects that we think are, you know, kind of stretching these ideas. So if one was a symposium on starship century, if we built a starship, you know, if we took a hundred year long project to create a starship, you know, why, how, um, you know, what, what, what would it end up being? And bring, bring together people like Freeman Dyson and Paul Davies and Neil Stevenson and uh, people running, working at running SpaceX and, other, and NASA to talk about this. So we have this series of, of lectures that we try to take these kind of topics that require this kind of uh, interdisciplinary in, interrogation from you know, a new the kind of our science of understanding it the kind of cultural and social impact that different kinds of questions have. So whether it's planetary defense or the discovery of, you know, the, the, of the first exoplanets and now the th several thousand exoplanets just leading up to having billions and billions of exoplanets that we all know are out there. Um, uh, looking at the kind of cognitive aspects of math, that math has, you know, that different kind of cultures have different relationships to concepts of, of space and time, and it gives them different ideas about what uh, different mathematical concepts, um, to things about the multiverse or things about the digital production of, of architectural environments. Um, that one's maybe too complicated to go on. And then we have this science fiction film series. Uh, and so we'll bring people that have a relationship to, the, to these notable science fiction films. So for instance, this is Jill Tarter, who the Jodie Foster character is based on in Contact. Um, Gattaca, where we talk about Larry Goldstein, who is the director of the uh, Sanford Stem Cell Research Center. I'm sure that I'm sure it has a more specific name than that. But um, and a sociologist to talk about the issues of, of genetics and identity. Um, we did the Andromeda strain at the peak of the Ebola epidemics, just to add some fuel to the fire, you know, and. Um, uh, I don't want to talk about that now. Oh, so then we have these ways in which we study and interrogate uh, imagination. Um, I thought I had another couple of slides. My favorite slide, I left my favorite slide. Oh, there it is. I skipped over it. 2001, of course we do 2001. And we brought both uh, Hal and Dave uh, to 2001. And, um, and, uh, large-scale project that I'm not going to show because we're definitely over time now. Um, but we did this workshop with Stan Robinson and Marina Abramovich. It's resulted in an installation at the Venice Biennale right now and a film project and a podcast. So again, it kind of produces multiple things out of this. Um, uh, and and maybe, maybe I'll just start the, f I'll just show you 10 seconds of the film. Space is not empty. We are flying between the stars. Our voyage will take centuries. All our names never name. Possibly this is why we have come to this pretty pass and now lie dreaming together between the stars. So anyway, uh, that's all you'll get to see about. Um, so that's, uh, too much information, as they say, but uh, I'll take any questions. Yeah. So you seem to have a number of projects going on. Um, I'm just curious if you use your own imagination to manage projects. Um, you know, probably not well enough, I have to say. Um, 
But, um, but you know, I try to look at how, um, you know, some of these things, and I didn't really go into these, but there's other things that we're trying to do where we uh, figure out how to take imagination sessions and make them more actionable and subjects of interrogation and, and, and further development. So, I, so I'm interested in how my own imagination itself might be furthered and how other people's imagination might be furthered. But, uh, but the management part is, um, I, I don't know, I, I certainly probably should spend more imagination cycles on that. But those imagination cycles are precious. You, you, know, you don't want to spend them on administration. You want to spend them on creation of good stuff. Yeah, so, e so each little assembly, yeah. um, well, th so there's a genetic, the assemblies have a genetic code. Each of those little cubes you can think of as a cell that carries a copy of the genetic code. And what the genetic code specifies is uh, uh, things about the function of the assembly based on its morphology. It talks about how it can connect to other cells, and, and if it's connected in other cells certain ways, then certain kinds of functions express themselves. And then all of those functions, the attributes of each of those functions is expressed. And I've tried to come up with what, to me, is uh, the, uh, uh, the most reductive form that I can. So I have, like th I have like four kinds of cells that end up emerging. So there's a, a sense cell that uh, also brings uh, input, energy, nourishment from the environment. Um, there's a, a cognition cell that takes whatever those sense cells are getting, and they produce an output signal. The cognition cell takes whatever output signals are connected to it, and it in in integrates them based on whatever parameters it comes up with. And then there's an action cell, which gives an impulse uh, of a certain force in a certain direction at a certain frequency to the entity it's connected to. And, the, and it has its parameters. And then all of that, then the cognition and the they all have certain kind of metabolic rates that they need a certain level of energy. And um, so that gives the organism itself a metabolism. So I'm just curious about how you um, think about the functionality, because functionality is kind of a slippery kind of area to, to try to, to capture, right? And it can emerge and it can change. So I just wanted to know how much you kind of try to have almost like predetermined functions that you approach, but it sounds like from your description that they're much more uh, operational kind of uh, descriptions, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I described as exactly what's encoded in them. And then, and then if they, then, and so then two of them, I guess I probably didn't show this very clearly, but in, in the soup environment, they reproduce by mating. So they, so when they're also looking for food, they're also looking to mate. And there's certain characteristics that allow them to mate, there have, there's a level of kind of uh, uh, organism complexity that is within a ballpark of similarity that allows them to mate. They produce an offspring that you know, combines traits from both with a, no, with a bit of mutation rate that we can dial up or dial down. And, um, but you know, sometimes you'll you know, get them where you know, there was cognition nodes in the parents, and then the offspring don't have any cognition nodes, which a metaphor of parenting, I guess. Um, or, um, or you think they have more cognition nodes than they really have is another metaphor of parenting. Um, but uh, yeah, we tr I, so I try to keep that very reductive. And then as we scale up, I try to have this, the next level of, of environmental complexity still at the organism level described by still a, a kind of that s simple level of operational rules. And, and then see if the thing gets this kind of larger scale emergent complexity. I'm just uh, boys with the idea uh, from the examples you gave us. You started with the cubes, and then you developed on the second part, like with a more organic shape. Yeah. Is there something that entices you, or the reason that you start with cubes, something geometric instead of organic? 
Well, and, I, and what you'll see is, is when I actually end up finishing that second level, I think it'll have a, you'll see, the, you'll see a closer affinity. Now they're very far apart from each other aesthetically, and, and, uh, but they'll end up becoming closer together. Well, I, I wanted the cubes because I wanted it to be, I wanted it to read like it's a model. You know, this is, this is a schematic description of, you know, that we use to, and, and it's an abstraction of something that we think is an operational model of the world. But, I, you know, so I want to kind of keep it in that mode of, of you consider it as this model. And then now consider it as this model gets applied to these higher and higher levels of complexity that start to then kind of suggest themselves as being either organic or, or higher level cultural ideas. Or any other thing. Yeah. Um, so are there any research questions for us, either as scientists or designers, that you'd encourage us to, us to be thinking about for the future of the study of imagination? Well, um, for scientists and designers, well, one of the things that we're trying to figure out how to ask, and we've got some ideas, but you know, I don't think they're, I don't think they're, they're quite getting it yet. But this, uh, you know, this way in which we can kind of trace the influence and impact of ideas that are, you know, that are kind of speculative or forecasting or, you know, meant to kind of cause you to anticipate, and what the impact those ideas have on the world that actually ends up coming about. And so I, I you know, so we're trying to look at uh, ways in which uh, maybe different kinds of literature have certain kinds of themes at different times. So if we look back at the kind of history of science fiction literature, you know, what are the, you know, you know dozen, hundred or so themes that kind of appeared in, in science fiction literature of 1952, and uh, can we put, can we give come up with a is there a taxonomy of those? How does that how do those themes relate to the kind of worlds that ended up coming? What are the certain kind of attitudes that are come around those kinds of themes about you know their dystopian impacts or their utopian ones? And and it's a level different than saying well they said flying cars you know we still don't have flying cars, you know. Um, so the most interesting thing about about science fiction isn't the kind of first order things that they describe, but it's always those second, third, and fourth order effects that these things end up talking about. And so being, so that discerning those is, you know, part of the trick. So the flip side to that is the, the failure of imagination with real science, where you have in the, all sorts of unanticipated effects from, what, DDT, and now we're looking at GMOs, what should we be looking wider at that we haven't, and how does that fail? Yeah, so there's, you know, there's this, uh, you know, so I think, you know, so much about the Clark Center is this kind of like very utopian kind of thing, you know, that, uh, that you know, another way that I described this early on is that I, I think there are these, there are these different attitudes about, about the future that come out of uh, science and engineering that are different than the attitudes about the future that come out of arts and humanities. And so I'd say that, and maybe I'll just pick on the humanities and not the arts right now, but I'd say the humanities are inherently skeptical about future, about the future and future developments. And, um, and science and technology are inherently naively optimistic about, about the outcomes of their work. And, you know, so what is it about the kind of historical analysis basis of the humanities of being able to look back on things and interrogate and uncover that is, you know, really, really a powerful methodology of understanding and understanding kind of un the unanticipated, understanding the multiple, understanding the hybrid that isn't a part of thinking about the developments of futures that comes out of scientific and technological work that often things are cast in these fairly simple, uh, you know, notions of outcomes that, you know, ubiquitous vision is inherently a good thing, 
You know, we all want that, or, you know, or omniscience, you know, of our information systems is just inherently a good thing. Um, now, maybe it's a good thing, but maybe, but, but maybe there's other ways to think about, you know, knowledge or, or uh, you know, what we know about what and what we know about who that, are, that might actually shift the direction about how technological research and scientific questions are asked. Um, so, I, so there is a, a hope that there's this kind of level of discourse that can happen between these fields where we can bring this kind of analytical, critical smarts of the humanities with the kind of inventive uh, thrust of science and technology. Um, so we, in part, that's why we stage these conversations around these kind of large issues that try to put those different perspectives into play with each other. Thank you. Thanks, Don.